So you curious as to where Bitcoin's gonna be in the next three to five years, wondering how the SEC regulations are gonna affect the whole market and what the hell is going on with inflation? Well, our next guest, Steve Ulrich, CEO of Voyager, touches on all those and also gives us his thoughts on whether or not Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. Here's a hint, he's not. I gotta be honest, man. The, the one question that's been burning me, and I'm asking everyone, uh, because I didn't believe it. Do you think that Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto? Oh, no. Come on. Not at all. Right. Not at all. You know, there's not, so... Not, not at, by any stretch of the imagination. Why, how come, why not, though? Like, I mean, I, I have my own personal reasons, but I'd love to hear why you think he's not Satoshi. Because the reason why I say that is because I think if he really was, I think he would be, he would really stay confidential and stay anonymous. I mean, that's the whole key to it. It's like, you're not saying it like you or I say, it. I just think it's, it's a way to grab attention rather than uh, what he kind of, when it was started, it was like, why would you do it 10 years later? Because it's a hit now. Uh, claim it when you did it. You know, I, I just don't believe it. I just don't, I think it's, I actually think it's a group of people behind it that built it. Uh, and it's not one person. Yeah, I think I, if I had to put money on it, I would say like Hal Finney or somebody like that because that would make a lot of sense in terms of he was the first person to receive crypto, the Bitcoin, and then, yep. you know, so he definitely knew who Satoshi, Satoshi was. The thing that drew me for a big curveball, because I was keeping up with, I'm a Florida native here, so I was keeping up with the whole trial with Craig Craig Wright, and obviously he's incentivized to uh, to become the creator because he has Bitcoin SV. He's trying to push as hard as he possibly can. Um, <laughs> but like the, the thing that I found really odd was that uh, oh my gosh, I, I'm not going to think of his name now. It's one of the early guys that Satoshi was talking to in the forums. That was uh, Gavin. Gavin um, was convinced for a, a while that oh, maybe he is Satoshi. Then he's kind of backpedaled a little bit, a little right. bit on that. Uh, look, I mean, it, it's to me, uh, like I said, I think if it was, you wouldn't wait ten plus years to kind of claim it. You would have said it much earlier. Uh, and some, I mean, I just, you know, like I said, my thought process has always been that it's probably a group of people that put it, you know, that, that wrote it. Uh, and they are the ones that know, I know it's really hard for a group of people to stay quiet on anything. Uh, but I do think it's, a, it, it's some four, I'm not saying a group being 10, a group being three or four. Uh, and they've, you know, they've been able to stay anonymous. And I don't, you know, I don't see Craig Wright as the leader of the Bitcoin world. Do you think that Bitcoin needs a face to, well, I guess it doesn't necessarily need a face to survive, but do you think that by being able to, like, you know, you think of Apple, you think Steve Jobs, you think Microsoft, you know, you think of um, Bill Gates. Do you think that if Bitcoin had a central figure that it would have easier on-roads for adoption? Someone can kind of go, oh, that's the guy. There's some accountability because of that mystery. We don't know who created it. I actually think the opposite. I think the fact that we really don't know who created it gives it the power behind it because if it was one person you'd probably get all this like oh okay how much does he own what is he doing you know how much control does he really have you know so i think that the anonymity of it is probably far better yeah. uh, you know and, and and look we're gonna go i mean someone just uh landon castle just texted me and he's like uh what a miserable day in the market today uh oh, no, everything's getting wrecked it's like we're going to have ups and downs. I mean, but look, it, it's, you know, I obviously follow our stock quite intently every day. Uh, and I look at all the fintech in the fintech world, the public companies. It's not just crypto. It's all it's like everything technology oriented is is, is uh, getting beat up a little bit uh, today. And it has been for a little while here. Yeah, you know, and, and the thing we always hear about is market manipulation, and a lot of people talk about the leveraged longs. How do you think that those two things play in a factor into the the ups and downs we see in the crypto space? Oh, I think there's no doubt. I think the lever, the leverage in the space, is consistent with what we saw in a lot of bit of the FX world, you know, 15 years ago when there was a hundred to one leverage, uh, and it made it really volatile. Some of the spot currencies, so. The leverage to me is one of the reasons we have so much volatility uh, because coins move, you know, 100 to 1 leverage has to just move 1% and, and people are out of their money. They're blown out of their position. So uh, there's no doubt I think the global 
aspect of the leverage is what's causing a lot of the volatility. Do you think that there's going to be um, more, well, I mean, there's going to be more regulation and oversight, but what challenges does it pose having a um, an exchange when there's kind of this ambiguous lack of regulation and we're using antiquated things that kind of overlay the top of crypto? And, uh, I really think regulation will be really good for the industry, thoughtful regulation. And I think it really truly has to be led by the U.S. because I think that you know, there is starting to have frameworks globally, uh, but the U.S. is still a very big portion of the global economy. And we need some regulation here that gives clarity to the world. Um, and it's hard. I mean, for all, all of us playing in the space, it's hard because we have, you know, state by state regulation, although we do have federal regulation when it comes to know your customer and anti-money laundering. Man, there's just so, there's a lot of stuff that we need to have in place that gives customers the understanding that their assets are fully protected. And I think that's the biggest challenge is putting a framework together that gives customers that that belief. Um, and there are companies like us and, and the other one that's public that you see financials quarterly, but all the other private companies have no, they don't have to put financials out. They don't have to tell you what assets there are. They don't have to give you the financial position. We believe that they're all just killing it and having great months, quarters, years, and have a ton of capital, but you don't know if they're siphoning capital off and using it for other things. You just don't know. You don't know the capital position of the company you're working with. And I think that needs to change. You know, you touched on something I wanted to talk about. I think one of the barriers for some people that I've talked to about keeping money on an exchange and they hold not your keys is that they're like, hey, this isn't FDIC insured. And if this gets hacked, I lose my money and it's gone forever. How do you address yep. concerns like that? It's a fair concern. I think you've got to, that's why I think the public company aspect, quarterly financials, people seeing that their money and assets are there are all really important aspects to the adoption. But I get that. I mean, this isn't FDIC insured. USDC, although it's got has zero volatility, it's only got the volatility of the dollar. The fact that there is an FDIC insured or CIPIC insurance or anything makes it look, you know, makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable. But then again, um, your FDIC insurance was great. And we almost tapped into that in 2008 as well. So. Uh, we didn't, which is the plus side, but I, I think we will have process and procedure in place and regulation in place to deal with that. But why it's really important that the companies people work with, you know, it, it very much, you can see their financials and see that they're solvent. Do you think that there'll be a time where uh, stable coins like USDC have a little more government regulation and they're able to be insured to some capacity, or is there a way to do that on a private level with um, Voyager or companies like that? Yeah, no doubt about it. I think we're heading towards the regulation of the stable coin and what you can do with it. Uh, clearly, the dollars, you know, like take USDC, the dollars that are backing the stable coin are in a U.S. bank, so there is some level of insurance behind that uh, and capital requirements. So I think we're not that far away from USDC being an insured product through the banks, and I think that regulation will be good uh, and well received, obviously. Uh, but I still think you know a year or two is when I say not that long away, because uh, everything in regulation takes time to write the rules, get them passed in Congress, and who knows? I mean, if we have a, I don't, I don't particularly speak political, you know, politics, but there's a pretty good chance that we don't have a blue wave next November. Uh, we get some, you know, uh, some bipartisan here. And I think that we'll have blue one house and maybe red, con whatever, you know, it's going to be split. And that will change some of the, the rulemaking. We, we may go for another four years with no, you know, another two years after that with no rulemaking because we're not going to agree on anything. It's funny, too, because in the in the macro space in crypto, like six months feels like a long time. People are like, I've been holding for months now. When is this going to moon? It's <laughs> to talk about regulation and the, the slow wheels that turn. You know, we look at the U.S.'s inflation rate. It's the highest it's been in 39 years. I think year, year over year, it's 6.4 percent. How do you feel the inflation rate and what people are experiencing in our economy plays into the crypto space? Uh, I think it helps us, to be honest with you. Uh, I think there's one, you know, there's four letters that make it, uh, four letters and one company that help people get through the, uh, 
the, the inflation. If it's 6.8% inflation and we're paying 9% on a USDC uh, as your reward, we're kind of outpacing your inflation. So why wouldn't you have all your cash in a USDC stablecoin? I think crypto helps alleviate the pain of the you know in, of inflation. You know, you talked about the nine percent on uh, USDC, and you know, you guys have five point seven five on Bitcoin, and I think four point five on Cardano. How sustainable are the interest rates that you guys are currently are offering, and how do you go about the valuation for those? Yeah, I think the we look at the market conditions. We look at um, how much we want to use as our marketing dollars to support the interest rates and the re what we call the rewards. Uh, USDC is really, you know, we're building a, our debit card off that. The Bitcoin and Ethereum markets are a little bit, you know, uh, softer in that space. But, you know, we look at it and say, okay, there's an opportunity for us to continue to grow market share by giving the rates we do. Um, whether we make that a little bit more contingent on the Voyager loyalty program and token, uh, that's something we're constantly looking at. Uh, but I think that there is, we don't see major, major changes across the board, uh, but there will probably be, you know, subtle changes on some of the rates. What do you think it's going to take for Bitcoin to have that watershed moment where it starts to really head on that? I mean, I, to a large extent, we're probably on that that trajectory that like Catherine uh, Woods and stuff talk about the, that 500K number that gets thrown around. Do you think it's a spot ETF or just more regulation? I think it's more regulation. I don't think... I don't think they, I think if you bring more regulation in the, in the spot world, then the spot ETF doesn't really matter anymore because then RIAs uh, and institutional advisors can actually participate in the spot for their customers. I think they avoid it now because it's unregulated and there's risk to the advisor in putting people in unregulated or private product and they might just buy the GBTC trust or so forth. But I think when there's regulation, then those advisors will definitely make Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a whole bunch of other coins available to their customers and put packages and put programs together around all the altcoins as well as the main coins. You know, I hate to put you on the spot, but does, do you have any valuation where you see the years 2030 and where Bitcoin lands? Because, um, you know, it's always interesting to hear these various yeah. predictions and look into those crystal balls. You know, my gut tells me you're talking about uh, you know, somewhere in the four to 600,000 range in the next seven or eight years. I don't, I'm not a million dollar believer yet. Uh, I think that takes longer time, but I think you're going to get to those levels in the next six or seven years. Do you think that we're going to see Ethereum over the next short term outpace the growth of Bitcoin as smart contracts and people are more building D apps? I would say yes. I, I would say Ethereum will outpace Bitcoin. Um, I was just having this conversation with someone at, a, at uh, uh, Tom Lee's holiday party the other night. Uh, and, you know, Bitcoin is, is not a smart contract protocol. I know there's a whole bunch of people trying to build certain things like that on that. But uh, let's see if I can get this light on again. I might be dead. Uh, but I think that, you know, Ethereum will outpace Bitcoin, but I think some of the other level one protocols will even outpace Ethereum. Hmm. Yeah, I it's mean, like cheaper, I, more efficient. Yeah, I think there's, there's. Do you think? I mean, it's not a zero sum game, but with things like Solana and Cardano, Polkadot, and um, even some of the newer networks like Casper coming up, do you think that um, the growth in these other protocol coins is really going to skyrocket as people get more and more into things like? you know, minting NFTs and smart contracts and it changes the trajectory of our society and our economics. A hundred percent do. I think that they're, that Solana's avalanche are bringing a whole bunch of, of efficiencies to the market and we're still very early, uh, but they're definitely more efficient than Ethereum. So I think that's absolute, absolutely, uh, one of the things that's going to change the crypto market in the long term. And these protocols are, are, are there. There's going to be others. There's going to be multi-chain protocols too that are being, we know they're being developed and being used. So I think there's just a lot of opportunity in that front. So take me back. You're sitting down with your friend over coffee. You guys are talking about crypto trading. How does Voyager become the, the catalyst for your next business venture? 
Oh man. Uh, well, you know, I've been capital markets for, at that point in time, I was in the capital markets 20 something years. Uh, so 1994, all the way to when I got together with, with my co-founders, 2017, 23 years. Uh, and we looked at each other and we said, okay, what are the opportunities in front of us? And, you know, what do we think is an industry that we can get in? It's still early that we can build a product that we believe can be game changing. And we all had done our research on crypto. Uh, we look at competitive products in the marketplace and we said, wow, uh, we think we could do something here. I looked at market structure and being a capital market veteran, I said, this market structure is a little screwy. Uh, there's so many exchanges. There's nobody that plays the role uh, for the benefit of a retail consumer. And we have an opportunity to do that. So let's connect to multiple markets uh, multiple exchanges and bring a best execution, quality execution to retail consumers. That's, that's how we got started. And, you know, we were kind of just naive enough when we started to think that we can challenge some of the bigger players in the space. And we've done a pretty good effective job of that uh, over the last, really by the time we got the product to market was November 19. So two years, you know, we've, we've brought a product to market to, uh, a million funded accounts, you know, six billion of customer AUM are going to have a record quarter on revenue. So uh, it's been amazing. Uh, but that's how we got started. I'm a capital markets expert. One of our co-founders, uh, Oscar Salazar, built the very first Uber app. He was the founding CTO. So when you take him, me, and then the serial entrepreneurs, Gaspard and Philip around us, we just brought a concept that we thought the market was missing. So this is your third startup, right? Uh, this is, well, I was with TIR. If you consider E-Trade a startup, then that would be the other one. Uh, so it'd be four if you consider E-Trade a startup. So being a serial entrepreneur yourself, I think it's safe to say, what do you, what are some of the lessons, um, you know, that you wish you knew going back that you learn now yeah. when you're going into startups? And I think the, the, the number one lesson I would probably say is there's never a wrong answer never a wrong idea that you might have a path that you think is the most appropriate, but you need to have smart people around you coming up with many different ideas because your first idea might not be the most successful. So, um, you know, I think it's one of the mistakes, you know, that, that entrepreneurs make it's like, here's the way it's going to work. This is what we're doing. And unless you, you know, and you're just going to bang your head against the wall until you're like, I'm going to get traction. But if you start not getting traction, you got to kind of figure it out pretty quickly because the, uh, the pool of cash doesn't, doesn't uh, last forever. Uh, and you need to, you know, have to get more investment. You need to show some growth or some, you know, something behind it. So I think that's the, the number one thing I learned early on was if something isn't working, you know, try to figure out another path to, to, to get some growth. What's the best and worst thing about running a Voyager? <laughs> uh, the uh, best thing is the people, you know, and, and people encompass the employees, uh, customers, investors, our token holders. I mean, I truly, you know, enjoy talking to every single one of them, even though when I get F-bombed on Twitter or something like that, uh, that's okay. I mean, we learn and learn from the mistakes and a lot of those people I reach out to and DMS and we have a conversation and they're like, Oh, he's not that bad a guy. He kind of knows what he's doing. And, but I learned from it. So I think truly the, the, the best thing is the fact that I get to, to interact with so many people, learn from so many people and meet so many new, new ideas and friends every single day. The worst part is you just don't sleep the yeah. sleep aspect of, of, of running a crypto company, running a, you know, a startup. And we might be a two, $3 billion market cap company, but we're a startup at, at heart. You just don't sleep that much. I mean, there's, you know, you're always thinking about what's next. What can you do better? How are you gonna improve the product? How do you help customers? How do you help investors, employees? Talk, how do you help? And so you, you, you wake up in the middle of the night with ideas uh, and I'll get out of my bed and I'll go to my phone, take my phone and, uh, jot some notes down and be like, okay, you know, this is for tomorrow, but uh, you just don't sleep. You're always thinking of new ideas. Your dad was an accountant. He said he worked 80 hours a week during tax season. Do you feel like you, you took a lot of that work ethic from him and that um, you model some of your business ethics after him? 
Uh, it, man, there's no doubt about that. I mean, uh, he, you know, he's my work idol. I mean, he, you know, probably just my idol in general. Uh, he would work during tax season. He's from, he'd leave the house at 7.30 in the morning, come back at 9.30 at night, uh, you know, doing tax returns for people. Uh, and that was five days a week. And then on the weekends, it was like 7.30 to 5.30. So, and this was January 15th, to April 15th. So he never got to watch my brothers or I really play uh, much high school basketball because we did, um, but he worked his tail off. And, but not just learning the work ethic from him because, you know, that's clearly where I get mine from. And, and my brothers work just as hard in their, in their jobs too. Um, you know, it's how to treat people. And my dad, you know, had his office in Long Island, uh, middle to, to, you know, a lot of middle to lower income, you know, were his customer base and he treated everybody equally. Um, and I always found that, you know, really encouraging and something I learned from because it didn't matter who you were. He gave you the same respect. If you were someone back then making a million dollars or someone making $10,000 a year, it didn't matter. He gave you the same respect uh, and he helped people who couldn't really afford his services at times and, and would give them severe discounts or maybe even not charge them at all if he knew they were in a bad way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a lot of who I am today uh, is based upon what I saw around what he did. Um, and so it's, it's truly, I'm just honored to be able to kind of keep moving along and be able to say that. Uh, and he's still alive, so I get to, to you know, he's really happy and proud of what uh, my brothers and I have all accomplished. So your dad is obviously, you know, substantially older than you because, I mean, he's been involved in accounting and really came from that legacy banking system, right? What does he think of crypto and what you're doing? Oh, uh, WTF. Uh, so, like, what the heck is this? Uh, but, you know, he, he, he has spent time trying to understand it and... You know, at the end of the day, he looks at it and says, I really don't have to understand this anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm 83 years old. Uh, I get what you're trying to do. I understand, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're, you know, successful, but it's hard for me to understand anything without cash and governmental policy behind it. Cause that's, you know, that's just the way it was. I mean, he was a young kid, uh, you know, during, during, you know, in the late thirties, early forties. So um, he just really doesn't, understand it we try to explain it but i get that it's not for him um but we try i mean i try all the time and and he does understand nine percent yield on a usdc stable coin he thinks that's pretty cool even though he doesn't understand how we give that to people but he does think that's pretty cool what frustrates you the most about the cryptocurrency space i think that's an easy one actually i think it's the lack of understanding uh, around our government, around how they can participate and really help and how it's helpful to the government to do this because it's helpful to the, to, you know, there's a reason why, you know, whatever the number is right now, 6% of the US population, which is somewhere around 20 million people and growing, maybe it's 30 million people that have crypto and want to own some crypto. And that the idea that wealth could be created off of something that's not natural to them uh, is frustrating because there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, to help the, the mid and lower class people in using crypto. And what's also extremely frustrating around that is we, we, we see all the reports that we put all this money into the economy, uh, you know, these, these checks, everybody got the $2,000 checks and how many have got them in the, got in the hands of scammers uh, because we didn't use the tools around us in blockchain to deliver it to wallets to consumers so we know they got them and they couldn't checks couldn't be stolen out of mailboxes ACH is in there like we didn't use the tools around us to get the right people the money so we wasted billions you know billions of dollars for that and that's frustrating as heck because we just don't you know there's opportunities to be efficient as a government we just haven't we we we, we tend to try to over regulate it rather than accept it yeah, you know, I, I completely agree. And, um, you know, speaking on opportunities, one of the things that I really like about Voyager is you guys are always adding new coins. And it seems like a lot of that comes from you listening to your customer base. But how do you guys go from like, OK, everyone's all these kids want the meme coin up there, the meme coin and Shiba Inu. And how do you value which coins or what's the vetting process like that are for the ones that are going to be listed on Voyager? 
Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty extensive vetting process. Uh, we, we belong to a council that you know rates coins. We actually do a lot of tech diligence on coins. We do a lot of legal diligence. Uh, we look at where the volume in the market is, what the you know what the spreads are on exchanges and market makers for the coin, so we can bring a quality execution back to consumers. Uh, but demand is always a key part. You know what are customers you know asking for? What do they want to trade? And look, the meme world is part of trading, and it will be here for the next next hundred years. Uh, the equity markets has become a lot, you know, a lot of meme trading too. So I don't, you know, we want to bring things to consumers that they can, they can potentially make money on. Um, and we also want to bring good projects to them. So we want to bring, you know, a combination of both. Like we loved when we brought Avalanche on the platform. We loved when we brought Solana on the platform because we thought that's opportunity for customers to really invest in the long-term future of those protocols. Now, something like Sheeb, or Doge might be a little bit more meme and have its up and downs and be more, you know, more active from a trading perspective. So we like the balance. Uh, and our job isn't to, you know, choose which coins people should invest in. It's about bringing them choice and bringing them together so they can they can actually uh, make their own decisions. So are, do you guys only deal in retail or do you also have some institutional people involved in your uh, platform? Only retail, uh, we've, we've started to expand to small to mid-sized businesses. A lot of our customers are small to mid-sized business owners. So we recently acquired a payment company called uh, a Coinify out of Denmark, out of Copenhagen. And we're embedding their payments into a bunch of merchants uh, and merchant systems here in the States to allow those same small to mid-sized businesses to accept crypto uh, you know, through payments. So, that's our expansion into inst you know institutional. It's not anything more. We're not going after hedge funds and private funds. And that's not where we are. We're a retail oriented business and a family oriented business. From your perspective, in, in you, I always hear about uh, the institutional demand because everyone's, you know, obviously it's, there's a huge wall of money that can come in from the institutional side. Is that something that you think is overhyped? I think it's slightly overhyped. I think we, we're getting more and more of that institutional adoption but it's still a fairly retail market. Um, and eventually I think you'll see, it comes back to regulation. When there's some, a little bit more of a framework of regulation, a lot more of these institutional advisors and funds will invest in crypto because they've got the regulatory environment to do so and won't get challenged by their investors. So um, I think that's when that big wall of institutional funds really comes in is when it becomes a regulated product. Well, speaking of products, you guys are offering a, a debit card. I know that I've, I've seen mm -hmm. there and get on the wait list. Do you have a date for when those are actually going to start getting minted? Uh, rolling out in mid-January, and we're going to uh, start that rollout and, you know, expect to have, you know, thousands upon thousands in people's hands over the first couple of months after rollout. You know, everything is, you know, we're testing the heck out of this. And but as once we get it rolled out to a few thousand people, we'll get more, a, a large group to test. We're going to keep making tweaks to it right from there. Uh, so, you know, therefore I think that, you know, over that first calendar quarter, March, we'll get quite a few people on the debit card. It's super exciting for us because I think that the fact that you can earn, it's back to what we said before, you could earn a 9% reward and outpace inflation and use your money at any point in time on your debit card. That's a pretty compelling product. Yeah, so, so I just, so I'm clear. So if someone has $10,000 sitting in USDC, the debit card debits from their USDC account, that's earning that 9% interest, or does it have to be converted to cash? Yeah, the, they don't have to do any conversion. So they can hold it in USDC, get that 9% yield, uh, the 9% reward. And they take their debit card, they go swipe it at the gas station. We do all the hard work on the back end, converting the USDC to dollars, delivering the dollars, to the bank who's then delivering it to MasterCard, who's then delivering it to the merchant, you know, the whole rails that it's got to go through. Uh, first step of using crypto and USDC, obviously the end game is really to use USDC without all the rails that take place that, you know, that I just explained, and that'll be more efficient for merchants, uh, but that'll take time. Uh, that'll just, you know, part of the adoption curve. So what do you think, what's the, uh, what's the big announcement that you had coming out here? And as we kind of get towards wrapping this up here, and I, we almost won't come out. Uh, this is going to be about a week from now. So I want to, I want to, I didn't hear anything that was too prolific in that last 30 minutes. Ah, look, I think, uh, you know, we're really excited about the announcement uh, 
Uh, we are becoming the official cryptocurrency uh, sponsor of the National Women's Soccer League. Uh, oh, fantastic. So we, yeah, we, we believe in the future of the NWSL. We believe the, uh, you know, Commissioner Marla Messing and what she's working on and, and, and building the NWSL. And it's the 10th anniversary coming up this season. And to be able to support these great women, these great athletes, we all, every, almost everybody, when the Women's World Cup is on and the, you know, we're watching that women's soccer team play. Uh, and so to be able to support those women, all those teams, all those individuals, uh, it's really exciting for us. And it, it's, you know, the way we've structured the partnership with the NWSL is a significant portion of the sponsorship and partnership goes directly to the players and opening Voyager accounts and getting funded and, you know, introducing them and educating them about crypto. It's the largest straight women's sports spot, direct women's sports sponsorship that's ever been announced. And we felt this is all about, you know, bringing a wider audience to crypto and partnering with a great organization. As we keep saying, it's crypto for all. And we believe, you know, women of America are underserved in this space. These women are great role models to, you know, the young girls uh, who, who really adore them. And we're excited, super excited to be partnered with them. So between NASCAR, Gronkowski, and the WMB, or WNBA, the Women's uh, Soccer League, how do you guys go about um, kind of figuring out who's going to be a good partner for Voyager? First, they have to be crypto, you know, friendly, right? So when you take Gronk, Gronk did the very first NFT. Um, and he's a great representative of our, our brand because of who he is. Just from, uh, you know, great person, fun person. I tend to say everybody wants to be Gronk or party with Gronk. Uh, but he's been so, you know, he, he's been really good for our brand and bringing, bringing the brand awareness to that. You know, then we, you know, with Landon and the NASCAR, uh, Landon has been a long time crypto. He started mining crypto seven or eight years ago in his own basement. Um, and so having someone who is, you know, talking to the NASCAR masses, which are huge about crypto, uh, we've been able and lucky enough this year that we've been able to get him uh, working with Landon. We got him in a colleague racing on a calling racing team. Uh, it's probably the best Xfinity team now in this in in the Xfinity series between him as a driver. Daniel Hemrick, who won Xfinity last year, and A.J. Allmendinger, who came in third or fourth in the Xfinity last year. It's the best racing team in the Xfinity series. Landon's now partnering with them with what we think is the best racing team. It's going to bring even more, you know, uh, recognition to crypto. Um, you know, the hood of the car says crypto for all. And we're, we're going to get it out to the masses. We're going to get people to understand crypto and the infrastructure behind crypto is the future. And that's what we're trying to do is that we're finding different avenues to support, you know, our belief that crypto and the blockchain is the future of not just financial services and money, but, you know, really the, the financial, really the infrastructure for everything uh, in our economy. You know, with um, crypto.com now is like the headline sponsor for me. They've been dumping a ton of money all over the place. But for the UFC, considering that 18 to 34 year old demographic, have you guys looked at all into partnering up with like a Bellator or a UFC or any of the more extreme sports to kind of put the Voyager name in front of more potential users? We really get, uh, I was on a call with a news reporter this morning and asked me something similar. We get every league, almost every team within every league, uh, whether it's a team sport or an individual sport, players, uh, whether it's tennis, golf, UFC, they all call us. We look at everything. Uh, we evaluate everything. But we have a tendency to, we were the first to do sports personalities. I had Matt Barkley. Uh, when he was the backup quarterback to Josh Allen in Buffalo, he, we had him as a, as an advisor and, and an influence for us. And then we had uh, Tracy McGrady. And so we were one of the first to bring athletes into crypto. So when everybody's going one way, we tend to look for opportunities uh, in different areas that others aren't flooding into. Uh, we don't want to be the, we don't want to be like everybody else. We want others to be like us. Uh, so that's why the NWSL is so important. You know, we think it's a great partnership. It's not, it's something that nobody else is doing in supporting women in crypto. So um, we're always looking at different stuff. We, we look at everything and we're very specific and we have a, a mindset of trying to 
what I call, you know, zag when everyone else is zigging. So outside of being a trading platform, the two big things that everyone hears about now are the NFTs and the metaverse. Is that, are those two areas that Voyager sees itself in, in the future? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we will be in that space in 2022. Uh, we're making some key hires in those roles uh, to build out, you know, our NFT offering. And again, it's not going to be like everybody else's. Uh, we have a mindset that's a little bit different. Uh, again, having seen how the online brokerage space grew up and everybody kind of did, did the same thing after 10 years, it's not where we want to be. We want to try to do things a little bit differently there. But NFTs 2022 for us, no doubt. Uh, as we're hiring a team to actually build some things out for us. Do you own any NFTs yourself? I do, but only low-end NFTs. Uh, the, and to be honest with you, I, I bought three NFTs and I lost two on MetaMask somehow or another. I can't oh, find geez. them. Uh, so there's got to be better solutions than MetaMask. Uh, sorry if any of the MetaMask guys are listening, but uh, you know, there's got to be better and easier solutions. Uh, so I'm afraid to buy anything with with any any value because I'm, I want to make sure I'm doing it right yeah. uh, and not losing a hundred thousand dollar NFT. Yeah, no, no shit. It's crazy. The um, these some of these NFTs like the Board Ape Yacht Club and um, oh gosh, it's Crypto Punks. It's like insane, millions of dollars for digital. And I've been, I was a detractor for NFTs for a long time, and I think that um, like smart contracts, they'll have their place. I think that personally, my personal feeling is they're slightly overvalued right now, and by slightly, I mean exorbitantly overvalued. But, you know, that's I'm not an expert on that. So um, I think that's sadly one of the barriers to entry into the crypto space. Like you talked about your dad and kind of being like WTF, right? Like, and I got my dad involved in crypto a while ago and he's like, he fell for one of those freaking scams where he, I got him on Coinbase and he yeah. bought some Bitcoin and he had a problem with his access. So he, instead of just going to Coinbase or calling me, <sighs> he, he Googles Coinbase customer support and gets some like T-Mobile forum with some dude in India who like, you know, just scammed him and was a bad actor and got all of his stuff. Then he's adamantly opposed to crypto. I'm like, that's like losing your wallet, never wanting to use cash again. You know, you, you, you've made an issue, but do you think that like those barriers to entry are going to get more like defined because like the ERC 20 address to, to Voyager is the exact same to address as the Polygon address. Like it was, everybody was happy. It's sent. And I was just like, why does it take nine days to process? That's crazy. Voyager's so yeah. fast. It is, it is absolutely something that has to change long-term, uh, make it easier for people. And I know there's a bunch of projects being done on that spot, on that space. Uh, but you hit on something else, which is the fraud in this, you know, and it's not just fraud on crypto. I mean, we know the guys, I worked with the guys at Robinhood and TradeStation at E-Trade. Uh, you know, we're all, we're all ex-E-Traders and, and alumni there. And so we talk a lot. And the fraud in the FinTech space that our government still doesn't understand in the banking realm is how blockchain will change that, how crypto will actually change it because the ACH fraud, the banking fraud, we, I read a, a research report over the weekend that said debit and credit card fraud, US is 40% of the world fraud, 40% wow. in that. And that's wow. probably light. And we just sit back and because we give banks you know, banks go back and you, you've probably done it. You know, you put something on your credit card and you're like, ah, I don't remember buying that. You go to your, your, your credit card company and you just say, I, I didn't, that wasn't me. They automatically take your word for it. Um, and that's not the way the system should be and that banks could just, you know, control that system so much. So we're changing that crypto is changing that the infrastructure and we're going to get rid of the fraud. You know, when you get rid of fraud, that means the system is, is more efficient. That means people, the prices of goods will come down because it's all impacted into goods is fraud. And that's good for retail consumers. That's going to happen. And we're all starting to change it, which is another reason why crypto, the blockchain and the infrastructure being built is so important. Yeah, I, I feel bad for your dad because I've seen these podcasts. Someone put a tweet up about that too. That's it, it, these scammers are after, after people's wallets and the phishing schemes. It's, it's ridiculous. And the government needs to step in because they know where it's coming from. It's coming from China, India, Russia, Nigeria. Go get them. You know where it's coming from. Stop it. And we just don't. 
Yeah, it's crazy. And, and just to, before I let you go here, I, I, I have adamantly become a, a legacy banking hater, man. Like for the first time in three years, I stepped in my foot into a bank the other day and I had to get a money order and they're like, you have to deposit this into your account. I'm like, well, this, this is going to show as an income. I don't, can I just get the money or no? Yeah. And I was like, oh my, it was the worst customer service. And I was just like, this is why I'm so, so, um, so passionate and bullish on not only the cryptocurrency space, but Bitcoin and as store of value and peer to peer and eliminating that, that, that third party. But you know, when you're, when you're changing something that's just, the wheel is slow to move, right? Because like the, the address of the total addressable market is so large for the cryptocurrency space. It's not going to happen overnight. And that's the one thing I wish these, uh, these high school kids and college kids that were dumping, you know, thousands of dollars into meme coins and then getting all pissed off when they lose their money is that you have to look at the 10 year picture, man. We're so early in this still. So we don't even have regulation around this yet and there's billions of dollars transacting a day it's crazy oh look i think the we're, we're on the same page we're so you know i i put everything into sports that's what all my analogies tend to be uh we're in the top of the second inning i think here uh so much you know so much room to grow uh so much wealth creation but so much change that we can do and look when i first got started in the industry I probably had the same doubts as everybody else. Like, really, you know, we're, and the more, you know, I, I speak to people, Mark Cuban and I spent a lot of time talking about Polygon and Matic. And, you know, this is like, we're changing the world. And this is just, it feels good. When you said like, what else is the good thing about running Voyager? It's the fact that I, I really believe that we're changing the world for the positive. And that's a really important, uh, it, it's easy to wake up in the morning uh, on that note. Yeah, for sure, man. When are we going to see a Voyager podcast? Got to start the, the weekly talk and all that. Let everyone know about all this cool stuff going on and all the new chains. And there's so much lack of information out there, I think, right now. You could go ahead and email my CMO because we've been talking about that for a while. Uh, we want to do it. It's on our, our plate. We're, uh, uh, you could tell this isn't the greatest studio around where I am in, in my house. So we're, we're, we're building one in uh, what's hoped to be a new facility we're moving into in the next couple of months. So we probably launched something, hopeful to get something out there about it. Cause I think people want to hear from, uh, from some of our partners, not just us, some of our partners, like Avalanche has been a great partner 100%. of us and John Wu. Yeah. And, and like, get them, you know, let them talk about it. And John and 88 Cardano. I think there's a ton of people that just um, yeah. need to be exposed more. And it's, I mean, so much of, uh, I mean, you're a digital company, right? I mean, most people are online watching YouTube, listening to these podcasts anyways already and they can get some more value from it. And those channels are just skyrocketing so much uh, in terms of the yeah. crypto space. So, well, hopefully we, uh, we see a, a cryptocurrency podcast from Voyager coming up and I appreciate you taking the time, man. And I'll ping you offline about the, the Matic stuff that I brain farted on. No, please do. Definitely. We'll, we'll help you out. And thank you so much for, for giving us the opportunity and giving me the opportunity. Uh, appreciate all the work you do and, and look forward to uh, speaking to you again in the future. Maybe I'll get you on mine and on the Voyage of Cryptocurrency podcast in the near future. Yeah, perfect. All right, brother. Take it easy.